first, we got these big, lumpy SUVs meant to go around the tracks. And now, we have the other side of that oxymoronic coin. Supercars going off the paved roads. On purpose. Full blown lunacy. Hey guys, step here with a list of the top seven best off-road supercars ever. They do be cool though. If you ask someone to draw you an off-road supercar, they'd probably come up with something like this. The Huracan Storato. Bravo. It's a mid-engine Lambo with a protective suit of armor, chunkier tires, and a longer traveling suspension. That's what she said. Add the all-wheel drive system from the regular model, and there you have it. A pimp mobile for those who'd like to get dirty. But how did we even come to this? Italian exotics used to be these highly stressed and fragile toys that would explode every second Tuesday in the month. What gives them a right to even think that they can survive in the rough and tough wilderness? The Germans. The Germans gave them the right. Lamborghini might be an Italian brand, but since the late 90s, it's been owned by Hans. So no more loosely fitted panels or two-hour lunch breaks. No, no, no. The new Lambos are built the German way. First work, work sends the fun. That right there is the main reason why the Storato can take quite a lot of beating and not fall apart. Other things that set it apart are a detuned engine that can survive longer in the red line and the lowest top speed of any Lambo on sale today. Now, those people who care only about the numbers, F guys, by the way, will say it's the slowest guinea you can buy. But so what? It's still the most exciting one. Why else would it have a heart rate monitor, guys? Huh? Bunch of stopwatch loving mother scumbags. Anyway, let, let, let's talk about the Porsche now. Although best known for their success on the smooth racetracks, they did nab a couple of dirt track victories throughout their history, too. However, when the untouchable Audi Quattro came around, one thing was clear. Beating that Group B monstrosity will require an entirely new kind of car. An all-wheel drive off-road supercar of sorts, called the 959. Yep, this Ferrari F40 rival was initially developed to go rallying. That's why it's so full of innovative first-ever tech. Like the system that can send power not only to all four wheels, but the fronts, rears, or lefts, or rights, too. Basically, to whichever side has the most grip. Sequential twin turbocharging was another first, as well as the tire pressure monitoring system and the active suspension. Basically, what the GTR Godzilla did to the circuit racing, the 959 was set to do in rallying. Too bad that the Group B division was killed off before this thing was ready to compete. It would have been nice to see a German civil war of sorts. Porsche eventually did test its capabilities on an even more grueling race, the Paris-Dakar rally, where the 959 finished first and second. And then, then they made the road version that could go 197 miles per hour, all while losing little to none of its off-road talents. See that G on the stick shift? That stands for Gelände, which is German for terrain. And now you know why. Also, it would be very unprofessional of me to mention the Dakar without talking about the Morgan CXT. Yeah, I know you expected a 911, but that's just a toughened up tribute to the 80s 953. Where's the Morgan? Now that's the real deal. It started its life as a regular plus four, a 2023 sports car that looks older than my granddad. But much like my gramps, it had taken some Viagra to keep up with the youngsters. Viagra in this case being modern BMW engines and drivetrains. Then it was handed over to Rally Rate UK, a company that's been billing Paris Dakar machines for the last 25 years. And this is the result. A road legal survival vehicle. The CXT has more ground clearance, underbody protection tires with big teeth in them, racks, tools, spares, extra fuel tanks, and the oh-so-obvious exoskeleton. Okay, that last one was more of a necessity, given that this and all of the other Morgans still have their body frames made out of wood, like actual wood. So you can't really expect it to survive all the kicks and the jumps with something that splinters. Thus, this. It also serves as a makeshift storage solution of sorts. Since there isn't much cargo space available, you can just tie everything to dangle on the outside. Why not? The price of all these modifications? $240,000. That's nearly three times more than what you would pay for the regular Plus 4. A hard pill to swallow, but hey, did you really expect a proper Dakar spec to come cheap? 
Nope. But worry not, my fellow poor people, because Ariel has an exoskeleton off-road solution just for you. Remember Ariel? Remember when they made that track-focused Atom? Thanks to a 300 horsepower Civic Type R engine and no weight to slow it down, this scaffolding looking little thing is so fast that it can change your face. Adam was the purest driving experience you could get, and now there's an off-road version too. They call it the Nomad, and design-wise, there really isn't much to talk about. It looks like someone had put that Thunderdome structure from Mad Max in between four wheels, and that's about it. Now, I know what the haters will say. So, it's just a buggy. What's the big deal? Well, for once, this buggy is road legal, and more importantly, it's an aerial through and through. The Nomad is just as much fun jumping over the dunes as it is playing around the racetrack. It hadn't lost any of its poise and finesse, despite a much softer and more forgiving suspension setup. Try doing the same thing in any other dune buggy, and you'll want to spin out on purpose just to get off that smooth track. Not so with the Nomad. This thing will give you more fun per component than any other car in existence, no matter what surface you're on. Back to the world of rallying with the Lancia Stratos. It is the first ever car primarily built to go rallying, and when I say car, well, it's more of a supercar, really. It's got a Ferrari V6 in the middle, a rear-wheel drive, and the design done by the same guy who did the Countach. <sighs> Consider also the fact that the Stratos was extremely tiny, and you'll end up with something that's more agile than a hummingbird. That, by the way, is important when the roads you'll be driving on look like this. As a result, the Stratos would go on to win the rallying title in 1974, 1975, and 76 easily, and it stayed competitive for many more years to come, like when it managed to beat the all-wheel drive Quattro in 1981. Yeah, that did happen. Naturally, there were 500 road legal versions too, because those are the rules. It's the law! And sure, the road engine was detuned by a lot. The only interior upgrade was hiding all the wires behind the dashboard. And check out the window mechanism. You slide this little thing along the arch, and that is the most you can open it. But this was all part of the experience. Stratos was built to be a rally car. And if you think that Lancia would apologize for not making it more practical, think again. And now for the polar opposite of the tiny Stratos. Gentlemen, let me present to you the absolutely ginormous Mega Track. Track. As in, the company is called Mega, and the car is called Track. That's peak 90s edginess right there. Looking at these photos, this may seem like a regular sized supercar with some extra ground clearance, but that couldn't be further from the truth. So hey, let me give you some comparison stats. The Mega Track is longer than the S-Class of its time, wider than the H1 Hummer, and if you raise the suspension all the way up, taller than the Porsche Cayenne. That's some proper beefcake right there. Because of this sheer size, there's more room inside it than in an average New York City apartment. Enough room, in fact, for a mid-mounted Mercedes V12 and a four-seater layout, too. This is the only such car ever made. And if it was on sale today, I'm HIV positive that it would sell like crazy. What rich asshole wouldn't want a supersized supercar that hisses from above on absolutely everything else on and off the roads? However, back in the 90s, there was no such thing as social media or the need to flex, which is why they managed to sell only five. Oh well, on to the honorable mentions, of which there aren't any. To my knowledge, there are simply no more than seven off-road supercars, but if you do know some, write them down in the comments. All right, at number one, it's that aforementioned Porsche 911 Dakar. I know, I said it's just a homage, but even so, this is the most complete, the most versatile, and the bestest, best off-road supercar there's ever been. For a decade or two, all 911s have been annoyingly good. I myself prefer the Italian exotics over these fast beetles, but it's hard to ignore the facts, and facts don't care about my feelings. Porsches are tough, like military-grade tough, reliable, practical, and no matter which one you choose, a 911 will always punch way above its price range. Now add to this mix the ability to conquer tougher terrain than most modern SUVs, and you have what's probably the most complete all-in-one dream car ever, 
Also, don't think that just because the Dakar rides higher and has heavier armor plating that it can't handle the racetrack anymore. According to Porsche engineers, it will still keep up with the 996 GT3 around the Nürburgring, and that's a track day car first and foremost. So yeah, it's still properly fast alright, and I haven't even mentioned the best part yet. You can get the optional roof rack thingy that's full of Bear Grylls merch or whatnot, but my favorite thing is the tent that you can pitch on top as well. How cool is that? It's not just a track day car or a rally car, but a motorhome too. And as such, this 911 Dakar is simply in a class of its own. Anyway, that's it for me today. See you in the next one.